If you would like to support the channel, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. More information in the description below. He's been through his fair share of fights. Most of them were just to survive. As a repatriate, if Sam ever fell, he just came back from the beach. But if he dies on the beach, there's no coming back from that. And Sam has found himself in the middle of a literal war zone on a beach. So if he dies here, that's it, it's a true game over. His saving grace is that the beings created here under the control of the combat veteran don't really pay any mind to Sam. He can get hit by stray bullets and mortars, but he's mostly just ignored during the mayhem of war. Once he reaches the trenches though, that changes. The combat veteran wakes up, he activates. It causes a piercing in Sam's head. It's the connection between him and BB. The combat veteran can sense it. So now that the owner of this beach is aware of his presence, a hunt begins to find this intruder. Every being in these trenches are going to shoot him on sight. The combat veteran does make contact with Sam a few times within the trenches, having to be forced into retreat for Sam to proceed. But this is his beach, and he is not a living thing. He will return again and again to hunt this intruder down. There are moments where Sam can hear the man's voice echoing. It's confused. He's asking where he is. After several exchanges of gunfire, the soldier does go down but doesn't vanish. So Sam goes up to take a look. He's human, not some monstrous thing like the BTs that he's accustomed to. But why would a human being have a beach like this? Nothing about this makes sense, especially how this man keeps returning to life. The soldier very suddenly awakens and reaches for the BB on Sam's chest, bringing them in close for contact. And then Sam sees it, another memory. That's where this man is from. He's the man that the BB in the memory was looking up at. Sam has seen so many of these memories, but a cohesive narrative hasn't been formed. In this particular memory, the man is tense, walking quietly, and then an alarm begins to sound and someone yells at him to freeze. When Sam wakes up, he's back in the living world, covered in mud and blood from the beach. Mama calls him, asking if things are okay. For the living, almost no time at all has passed. Sam left the distribution center, the storm vanished, the chiral levels in the atmosphere dropped, and that was it. Mama is confused by this discrepancy in time, if not outright dismissive. Sam's description of a battle and a man trying to take his BB sounds outrageous, and he doesn't try to convince or argue his case with Mama. He'll worry about it later, and he needs to meet up with her in person anyways at her lab nearby. She wants to take a look at the Cupid that Sam wears, make sure it's viable long-term tech. So, back to work. Mama's lab is nestled into a heap of rubble. It's an interesting place to build a lone bridge's lab, but certainly Mama has her reasons. Sam's BT sensor starts alerting when he's within the building. It points at the ceiling, near Baby Mobile, playing a little lullaby. Then, tiny handprints on the ceiling. There's a BT in the room. But there's also Malingan, Mama. The tiny BT is tethered to her, and it already tells a tragic story, one that Sam does gently inquire about. What is she? He asks, which Malingan easily answers. It's her daughter, and she is her mama. She shows Sam the tether between them, the umbilical cord, so to speak. This is why she can't leave. The baby BT can't move from this area, so neither can she. Getting to business, though, Mama shows him what she saw of that storm, the chiral levels on the map, and how they vanished when he went outside. But data from his cufflink shows something very different. The sound of gunfire, of war. There are timestamps in the log that prove his story. They're going to look into exactly what happened, where he went. All they can do right now is theorize. It'll take some time to figure it all out. Another chiral spike begins outside the lab, but she thinks she knows why these surges are happening, why these storms are occurring. More connection to the chiral network means potentially more chirelium being released into the region, more into the atmosphere. And that's not good because chirelium can be dangerous to normal folks. Mama had put limiters into the cupids to prevent that from happening, but Sam's must be faulty. So every terminal that he has brought online hasn't been regulating its chirelium output, and that's a problem that needs to be fixed. It wouldn't do to reunite the country only to slowly kill everybody in the process or cause another death stranding. It's possible that the storm he experienced was because of the extra chirelium in the region. She's already made him a new cupid, but it needs a limiter put into it. She specializes in hardware production, she can make or fix almost anything, but software isn't really her specialty. She's not the one who wrote the original software, and this is way too important of a function to be anything other than perfect, so Sam needs to go find the person who originally wrote the Cupid software. Her name is Lochna, and she's at Mountain Knot City. Their progress and the natural increase in chirelium in the atmosphere has also been affecting her daughter. 
Mama knows that the baby doesn't belong here and that they can't carry on like this forever. It's not right. It's not fair to either of them. Soon, she'll have to deem her work complete and face that terrible choice. Sam asks her if she wants to talk about it with surprising empathy, and Malingan immediately opens up about it, like she needed to talk about this for a very long time. She tells Sam about the terrible day when South Knot City was attacked by the demons. She was in a section of the city that was destroyed, in a hospital awaiting her C-section. She was trapped in the rubble, unable to move or free herself. It was pure cruelty that fate wrought upon her. She ended up giving birth in the rubble and her daughter died, and then her own body died, yet neither of them were able to pass. Malingan's soul stayed trapped within her body. It's like it became one with her daughter's soul and it stayed tethered to her flesh. That precious child was meant to be her sister's, a life for her twin sister to love and raise after the death of her partner. Malingan was eventually found by rescue teams, but she couldn't leave the site where her body death had occurred, the site where her daughter was bound. She kept the death of the baby a secret from her twin sister. She just didn't have the heart to tell her what had happened. Instead, she just chose to vanish. Sam asks Mama if she's really okay with all this, living a life in the shadow of the dead. She ends the conversation with a joking jab at him being judgy about choosing the company of the dead over the living. She takes a sample of his blood to test and then asks him to leave when the baby gets fussy again. Next stop, Mountain Knot City. It is one hell of a trip to reach the mountain. Remember, time between destinations are better gauged by days passing rather than just hours, and there's an unending list of requests for deliveries to be made around the region. The addition of zip lines makes it easier to get around the mountain zones once they're set up, though. Those quick lines of travel will be needed when mule territory gets in his way, or when precious cargo needs to be delivered within a time limit. Sam and Baby stop at a distribution sensor just north of Mountain Knot City itself, their last stop on the way, and that night he has a nightmare. It's of being on the beach, and BB is out of her tank next to him. Amelie is walking towards him, and BB changes into a broken doll with nails in its head. Then Higgs appears, slowly drives a knife into Amelie's chest, and takes her necklace as a trophy for himself. It's a highly effective tactic to freak him out, isn't it? Because when he wakes up, Amelie is conveniently in the room, and she doesn't have her necklace. She says that Higgs is in the city, which was established before Sam even began this, that there were demons there. She says that everyone is dead, which was also established before Sam even began this trip. But also, the city is destroyed and infested with BTs, another major city lost to these madmen. She says that she was able to sneak out to reach Sam. This might be their last chance to talk, but she's safe for now. And this is applying pressure to Sam. It puts her fate entirely in his hands, and there's no way that he cannot follow through now, right? His work is her only hope. He asks her twice where her necklace is, and both times she doesn't answer. She leaves before he can start repeating his questions. And the confusion and pain this causes him is very clear, because everyone is counting on him. His sister is counting on him. When Sam and Baby are packed up to ship out the next morning, Dead Man gives him a call. The doctor says that he's been doing some digging into the BBs in his own time. He found information about BBs being used in the field, specifically by a supposed group of separatists that were using BB tech. But a little reminder, remember Higgs and his BB, the doll in the pod that Amelie gave him? Well, they served as totems or links to Amelie and her beach. That's what Dead Man is referring to. They didn't actually have BB tech, they had Amelie tech. He doesn't know that though. Dead Man thinks that they were using BBs to track BTs, of course, but that these separatists may have been trying to map BT locations to force the original Bridges caravan into their paths. A big reason that BBs were so prolifically introduced back into use within Bridges was that supposed separatist theory. In Sam's BB, it doesn't have a service record for him to look into. It always struck Dead Man a little bit odd that they were using BBs, a technology that they barely understood. He's figured out that the original Bridge Baby experiments began around the time of the Death Stranding and that a void out in Manhattan was almost certainly caused by those experiments. He is slowly piecing things together, but he'll have to do a lot more snooping to make sense of the timeline and what happened before and during the Death Stranding. When Sam makes it to Mountain Knot City, he's taken aback at the woman that greets him. She sounds just like Mama, but she is right up his ass right away about the network. It's polluting areas with Kyrelium, and she wants it nowhere near the city. He kind of jokes asking her Mama if she hit her head or something, but the more he calls her Mama, the more irritated she gets. She has no idea who this mama is, and the UCA can take a hike off the broad side of a cliff. This is Lachna, the woman that he needs to speak with, 
and she calls the shots around here. She doesn't even hear him out, though. She ends the call before he can speak. She has no interest in dealing with Bridges. Die Hard Man gives him the call because this was kinda to be expected. He reminds Sam that Mountain Knot City needs to be a part of the network for it to be complete. Die Hard Man tells him that Lochna is Mama's twin sister, that they're two halves of the chiral network's entirety. One hardware, one software, both with dooms like one person in two bodies. He doesn't know specifically what happened between them after Malingan's incident, but they need Lochna's help to complete the Cupid. With Fragile's fast travel help, Sam is able to get back to see Mama in no time at all, to ask about how Lochna can be convinced to help them. When he walks into her lab, she's already got some new hardware for him, a new cufflink with a special weapon function added, cord cutters. And he knows. He knows where this is going. She explains that she was able to integrate his blood into the new design, a new weapon to cut BT cords. It is something that he can use out in the field to destroy BTs more efficiently, cut the cord of the BT and return it to the world of the dead. And once it's on his wrist, it's time to try it out. Malingan asks Sam to cut her cord. She knows that this world was never the baby's, but all the same, she didn't want her to leave it. Malingan tells Sam about Lochner's pain and her loss, about losing the man that she loved, their plans to make a baby from Lochna's eggs and her deceased partner's sperm. And of course, she meant to carry the baby as a blessed gift to her heartbroken sister, how the tragedy that occurred at South Knot City ruined everything. She doesn't tell Sam that her body had died that day, just that the bond between the twin sisters was severed after that. And it's time that Lochna knew the truth. If they're going to reconnect the world, then Malingan needs to reconnect with her sister first. It's time to sever this bond. By all rights, Malingan should be at her sister's side in Mountain Knot City, helping raise her chaotic niece in this crazy world that they live in. Not this. But reality doesn't really care about what's right or fair. This is a hard reality to face. Sam cuts the cord. Malingan watches the baby float up where something from the beach collects her to help her to the other side. She is finally ready to go home to her sister. She asks Sam to take her to Lochna. With the baby's cord cut, Mama herself doesn't have a lot of time left. She can make it to Mountain Knot City, but her body isn't technically alive. Her soul will need to move on from it. Sam loads her up onto his back like she's cargo, and the two begin their trek across the mountains. It'll be a far easier trip this time around because of the roads and the zip lines that have been put into place. But what will make it harder, right off the bat, is Higgs. It's like he was just waiting outside for Sam to come out, like a kid at school waiting for his friend. He wasn't expecting Mama, though. Not a big problem, because there's plenty of fun for them all to have. He pulls from the beach another massive beast, telling him that to make it out of this, all they gotta do is run, not get eaten. Even a creature like this can't leave its area. BTs can't roam. They're tied down, so those rules apply here, too. They're not near a population center, so they don't need to worry about this thing. Sam has Mama to worry about here, so they just run for it. They haul ass out of the BT area that's now covering Mama's old lab. Even with the ease of vehicles and technology, the trip back to Mountain Knot is a long and bumpy one. He still has to make on deliveries, send bots out into the field, meet with community leaders and bring them onto the chiral network, all with the dead weight of Mama on his back. But once they reach the zip lines of the mountain range, it's pretty smooth sailing all the way across. Mama tells him about the hospital collapsing, about her and Lochna's apparent telepathy, how they were conjoined twins in the room. After they were born, the operation to physically separate them, it only divided their bodies, not their thoughts or their feelings. In her heart, she believes that fully bringing the chiral network online means that everyone will share what she and Lochna have had all their lives. It's a beautiful idea, if not a bit magical as well. The closer they get to the city, the more she can feel her sister's presence, and it makes Mama truly happy. She kind of feels whole again. Once at the city, what's left of Mama starts to fade. She has been on borrowed time for a while, but there's enough left within her to reconnect with her sister. Without words, Lochna understands what happened, everything. She knows what Malingan went through, instant transfer of information. And despite the pain of it all, she immediately loves her sister again with no restraint and no need for an apology. Malingan tells Lochna that she needs to fix Sam's Cupid. She's literally the only one alive who can. Everything depends on her now. Make the world whole, just like she made her sister. And then Malingan is gone. Lochna is able to fix up the Cupid in no time, but something in the code kind of bothers her. Someone tweaked it. What was on the Cupid wasn't her latest version. She wonders if it wasn't Malingan herself that did it. This was all an orchestrated plan so that she could be reunited with Lochna and freed from the confines of her lab. 
Lochna tells Sam about Malingan's death in the rubble, how her soul was still trapped here because of the baby's tether. With the repaired Cupid, Sam can fully bring Mountain Knot City onto the network and repair the imperfections within the system. Kyrelian pollution will be brought under control and communications between cities will be a bit more stable. Be it good timing or because of the stabilization of the network, something truly wondrous happens after the linking. Malingan's soul, it joins with her sisters. The two of them share a beach as two bodies with one soul. Malingan's soul will not pass on to the afterlife, but it will also not return to her old body. She won't be a BT. She will remain within Lakna. The two of them conjoined again as they were in their mother's room. Now truly they will never be apart. And this time, it's like two souls in one body. Die Hard Man jumps on the line to congratulate everyone, to welcome Lochna back into the fold, and to tell Sam a bit about what they learned after his visit to that crazy battlefield. The landscape, the munitions, the uniforms, it all points to Sam being on a battlefield in World War I. This solidifies that Sam wasn't hallucinating or anything like that, and either he was sent to another dimension or this really was somebody's beach. No one has ever had a beach like this before. For it to take that shape means that whoever is in control of that beach has one hell of a will, or there's something fueling it. The best person to talk to about all of this will be that weirdo, Heartman. But for now, it's time for everyone to get some rest because tomorrow is a new day. The next morning, Deadman pays Sam a visit because there's something funky going on with his baby. Deadman says that he went to Baby's beach. Bridge babies are so effective because they're firmly between life and death, neutral to both sides, neither alive nor dead. Bridge, yes, but baby, no. Deadman insists that their equipment, they're not actual babies, but Sam's baby is starting to exhibit the traits of one. She's starting to put on weight, her brain is more active, she's retaining memories and becoming self-aware. To Sam, that doesn't really seem like a problem, but to Deadman, this hardware is malfunctioning and it'll cease functioning within a few days. That means it'll kill it, since they can't remove baby from the pod. Sam has started calling the baby Lou. He's already named her and Deadman is full of empathy, so He's going to take BB for a few days, and essentially he's going to reset it, get its alignment back to normal, or do whatever he can to restore the BB. There's a bit of a tussle between them, BB pees on Deadman, and then he complains of being grimy from visiting BB's beach, but Deadman is a wily one. He quietly removes Sam's cufflink and his own, and he walks into the shower, because the shower is one of the relatively few places within bridges where there's actual visual privacy. They can talk in there, turn on the water, not worry about having to hide their mouths. And if somebody calls in, they'll hear the intercom. Sam gets the strange hint that they need to have a conversation, so he follows Deadman into the shower. Deadman spells it out once there's running water, being very blunt about needing to keep this off the record. And it's important enough that he doesn't really care that Sam doesn't want to physically be near him. Deadman knows that the BB experiments never actually stopped, not even after the president was killed in that Manhattan void out. Bridget was brutal in her pursuit to understand BBs and their relation to the beach. Furthermore, they were using the BBs as human sacrifices, essentially, to act as the foundation for her chiral network. He doesn't understand how Die Hard Man relates to all of this yet, but he is afraid to find out. They know so little about that man. They don't even know his real name or how far back his record really goes. It's like he didn't exist before the Death Stranding. Deadman hopes that as they collect more public information within the chiral network, he'll be able to piece more things together. But as it stands now, he doesn't think that they can fully trust the masked director of Bridges. Sam will have to work on his own for a while, until BB is fixed. Die Hard Man tells him that Higgs has created a massive tar belt around Edge Knot City, turning it into a massive BT region. He cannot go there without BB to help him spot the BTs. So for a while, Sam needs to go about his deliveries, making the chiral network stronger, bringing preppers and isolationists into the fold, save other porters that need help out in the field. And it's all worth it, not just for BB's recovery, but also for Bridges' personnel. Hartman, in particular, learns of fascinating stories as Sam connects more people to the network. He learns that the Death Stranding that started some 30 years ago wasn't at all the first one. It's a process going back millions of years. He asks Sam to stop by his place up in the mountains to connect him to the network too so that he can get access to more publicly available information. And then not long after that, Lochna calls him. Or Malingan Lochna. Malachna. Lochingen. She, they, say that they have found another of those temporal phenomena, the same storm that pulled him into the war beach. It's near Mountain Knot City. These supercells are going to occur regardless of Chirelium limiters in the cupids. And again, she can't see it, but it is there, and it's something that Sam needs to be aware of. And then not long after that, Deadman gives him a call. B 
baby is technically better and ready for a pickup, but that supercell that Lochna called about, the one that's headed toward Mountain Knot City, it has him in a bit of a predicament because he decided to take BB out for some field testing and now he can't get back. The storm has him trapped. He can't go outside. He needs help, so he asks Sam to meet him at a cabin on the mountainside. And I will give you 10 seconds. 10 seconds to predict what is going to happen as soon as he gets to that cabin. Go ahead. Go ahead. Dead Man has Dooms too. He can absolutely go to the beach. He gets pulled into the vortex and not long after, Sam does too. They are now both on the beach of the combat veteran. Dead Man is a doctor, a researcher, a great mind within Bridges. He is not a fighter. He knows enough about Sam's first foray into that supercell to know that whatever is here, it means business and that he needs to hide. He at least has BB with him and the two stay connected, and she helps him avoid this. This man, a combat veteran, Clifford Unger. When Sam wakes up, he's in the middle of a war zone again. A different era, different dangers, but the same threat of death. Remember, even if you are a repatriate, if you die on the beach, that's it. There's no going back. Game over. Thankfully, the chiral network functions here, and Dead Man can ring Sam on the cufflink. He thinks that the combat veteran is their way out of this. He'll be waiting for Sam in the sewers. This seems like a World War II era city battle, though it's all the creation of someone else's mind. The noises and the chaos of it never let up. A single wrong step will put you directly into the line of fire or on a bomb or in an enemy combatant's warpath. When the creation of this soldier's beach are cut down, they're replaced by new ones. It's a never ending process. Sam does track dead men down deep into the sewers. Thankfully, he and Baby are both just fine. Kind of seems like the two of them have become friends. Baby hasn't seen Sam in quite a long while now, and she went through some really tough medical procedures. Dead Man is kind of fond of her now. When Sam picks her up, she turns her back to him, seeming to prefer Dead Man instead. And when Sam reconnects with Baby, they don't share any memories like they did before. Got a bit of an attitude problem going on here, kid. Dead Man gets why Sam is so fond of the kid, even calls her Lou when Sam corrects him about how he refers to her. He will stay down here hidden while Sam takes care of the soldier. That should bring this beach crashing down. With Sam and BB connected, the soldier will be able to detect where they are. And as soon as they're back on the surface, he awakens. He can't pinpoint them exactly, but he can get pretty damn close. They're no longer bystanders in the field, they're actively part of it now. Sam and BB confront and fight the combat veteran and his forces several times over. Every time he's shot, he calls for a retreat and backup. He sets the rules here, but he also plays by the rules. Like, he's not truly aware of how much control and power he wields on his own beach. The last time Sam takes him down, the soldier laments his choices. He calls for his BB, apologizes for what he's done. He feels like something is all his fault. His guilt, a crime he allowed. For a while, he's calm, and he looks at Lou. And then he looks at the keychain on her pod and he lunges at Sam. The combat veteran truly believes that this BB is his child and Sam stole them. He wants his child back, but he's too weak. He can't overpower the intruder on his beach. The two pull together. Sam sees the soldier's dog tags and reads his name and a memory is shared between them. From the perspective of a BB, Sam sees this man while he was alive, struggling, injured. He's locked himself into some place. He's being hunted. Then darkness. Sam has a nightmare that something has happened to BB, but he and Dead Man are both back safely in a Bridges facility. The good doctor drops in to visit when Sam is up and moving. BB is still not being very friendly towards him, actually showing a preference for Dead Man instead. But then the coroner kind of crosses a social boundary, if this world even knows what social boundaries are. He talks about the name Lou and what Sam and his wife were going to name their baby. He talks about Lucy's death, the void out that followed, the suspicion and blame thrown onto Sam afterwards, his vanishing once it was all said and done. It's pretty heavy handed and blunt. It's not how normal people discuss delicate topics. But then, as though to make it better, a reveal about Dead Man's own past. He was never really born. He was created like Frankenstein's monster. 70% of his body isn't even his. They were parts harvested from cadavers. He doesn't have a soul. He calls himself a soulless meat puppet. He has no beach. This connection that he's felt with Sam and BB isn't something that he's ever had before. It makes him feel like he does belong, and it fascinates him, so maybe we can forgive him his social faux pas. When Sam came back from the beach, he had the combat veteran's dog tag in his hand. 
and Deadman has already been looking into it. Clifford Unger, U.S. Special Forces. He fought in Kosovo, Iraq, and Afghanistan. He'll keep looking into it, though, secretively. Oh, and he managed to take care of the whole die-hard man listening in situation somehow, which sounds a little bit foreboding. Leaving his private room, Sam reconnects with Bibi, and he does get a memory. The two of them are starting to get back into their groove. He sees that man, Clifford Unger, looking at Bibi. When a man walks into the room, Clifford knows him, calls him John, and John calls him Captain. The two seem like they're friends. Clifford says that the woman in the bed is his wife, and the two men embrace. John gives a brief condolence for the wife's state, and then the memory is over. Sam is almost ready to trek to Edgenaut City, his final destination, where Amelie is supposedly being held. But he needs to make one more knot before going there, Hartman's lab. Hartman asks Sam to bring those dog tags and Mama's corpse. It's showing no signs of necrosis, and he would like to know why. Lochna brings out her sister's body, but there's not a lot of sadness in her voice. After all, her sister is with her now. They're together in a living body. It's easy to let go of the past when they have such a bright future together. Zip lines make the trek up the mountain quick and easy. And as they go, Sam plays with Bibi, whistles to her, and she grooves and dances in her pod. She giggles as they go up the zip lines really fast. They bond again like they were never really apart. Hartman's lab is high in the mountains, where it's believed that the veil between life and death is thinnest. And boy, oh boy, does he study in the lap of luxury. Look at this place. I am fiendishly jealous of this setup. Hartman looks like he's taking a nap when Sam rolls in. But when he gets close, there's a monitor saying cardiac arrest and it's on a countdown. When the countdown is done, Hartman is defibbed and he wakes back up. A shock must have been one hell of a kick. It couldn't have felt good. Hartman is an interesting character. Every 21 minutes, his heart stops beating and he spends three minutes on the beach. Rinse and repeat. He goes there to search for his family, his wife and his daughter. 60 times a day, every day. He has been there 218,549 times. This is just how he lives. Hartman is obsessed with the idea that the beach is a literal place and his family is there. He thinks that if everyone's beach is different, then everyone's afterlife might be different too. But the prospect of spending eternity alone is frightening. He wants to know the truth, if his family is together, if he can go and be with them. If he can find them on the beach, then he won't come back. He'll pass on to the afterlife to be with them so that they can stay together. Hartman can connect to and pass through other people's beaches with an ease that not even Fragile or Higgs has. He thinks that maybe it's his twisted heart that makes it possible. Malingan's body has shown no signs of decomposition, no signs of necrosis. She's like a perfectly preserved mummy, and he wants to know why. Packed in with her body is what looks like an umbilical cord, but it's highly unusual. It's like a physical BT tethered, and he wants to understand more about it. The battlefields that Sam has been experiencing on that beach, it also has him perplexed. It doesn't make sense that so many men would be on a single beach from a completely different era, dying over and over again. No, this is a completely different type of beach, one that he thinks is possible through an era of powerful regret, resentment, and desire to live combined with one focal point, Clifford Unger. It's like Clifford can control a special sort of wartime purgatory, but all he has right now are theories, and he really can't say for sure if Higgs has anything to do with it. Hartman takes his three-minute dive back into the beach, leaving Sam to sit alone for a few minutes. Hartman has done this so much that his physical heart is a bit misshaped now too, but he doesn't seem like the type that's really interested in a long, healthy life. He's the sort that will do whatever it takes. As he puts it once he wakes up, his soul is on the beach, his body is already dead. His 21 minutes in this room, it's just filling time for him until he can go back to look for his family. Hartman opens up a bit to Sam about what happened, what made him this way, what happened to his wife and daughter. Before the Death Stranding began, before the void out started, he was having heart surgery at the edge of a city. They believed he was going to survive, so his wife and daughter happily went back home to collect some things for him. While they were away, separated from each other, the void outs began. His family was caught in the blast. He wasn't. Power went out of the hospital, his life support turned off, and for a few minutes he went to the beach. Thousands of people were walking it together, unified in their final moments, walking to the shores of the unknown, to the afterlife and he was confused about it. He asked an older woman on the beach what was going on, but Hartman didn't belong here. His body was still alive. The doctors in the ICU started to revive him. He saw his wife and his daughter walking together into the waters, and he called to them. He wanted to go with them. 
But before he could reach them, his soul was forced back into his body. He was saved, to his complete, devastating horror. Three minutes of death in the living world doesn't mean the same thing on the beach. Time is different there. He goes and he walks the beaches of other people until he gets tired, and then he comes back to continue his research. It's all he has. It's all he wants. Before his next three-minute timeout, Hartman gets Sam on his way. He tells him a few stories about the Death Stranding throughout history. He's got some colleagues that he once brought into the network, fellow doctors and researchers who can help him fill out the timeline. He hopes that within the fossils located at his colleagues' stations will be insights on the Death Strandings of the past. Perhaps they can find out something that will help them stop the current one. That massive tar belt, the one that Higgs is suspected of creating near Edge Knot City, it very, very conveniently took out a number of old fossil research stations. Hartman wants to build a new system in a better location, far away from those tar belts. He passes out mid-sentence, but Sam has all he needs to get going. Bring those scientists into the network before finding Amelie. The trek about the mountains are cold as hell and just as dangerous. There's not a lot of civilization up here, but that doesn't mean there are no BTs. Terrain is difficult, snow gets deep, a slip can send Sam and BB tumbling, and relatively short stretches feel far longer because of the elements. But each station he brings onto the network expands their knowledge of ancient death strandings. After all, if you don't understand the past, then you're doomed to repeat it, right? With each reveal, Hartman pieces together exact points in history where mass extinction events took place, corresponding with death strandings. It all eventually leads Sam back to Hartman's place, once the connections are made. He's been looking into Mama's unique situation, her baby BT, her soul separating, being bound to the baby. Her cells were full of chirillium, cells that shouldn't have been active, yet somehow they were. Hartman waits for his death countdown to reach zero, but he doesn't go down. Instead, he says he's done some modifying of the log times. He wants to have a very private conversation with Sam without Bridges or Die Hard Man listening in. Dead Man has sent a message with Mama's body, with the umbilical cord. Turns out that cord isn't Mama's. It came from the body of Bridget Strand. Now, given Mama's situation, it could make sense that she would have a BT umbilical cord, but Bridget Strand, why would she? And furthermore, it wasn't attached to a fetus, the cord was outside of her body. Before she died, Bridget gave her umbilical cord to Dead Man and made him promise not to show it to Die Hard Man. God, these names, it's just really hitting me hard right now, God. Now Heart Man gets to unfold his working theory. Other stations that Sam has connected to the network, they've found evidence of these timeless, unaging corpses and umbilical cords attached to them. Ancient creatures which shouldn't have umbilical cords. Five in total, five corpses showing no aging, five umbilical cords, each corresponding with a mass extinction event. And Hartman theorizes that each of these beings are related to those events. Mama was connected to the beach because of her baby. Her corpse is not decomposing because of the amount of chirelium in her cells, but she didn't have an umbilical cord. Bridget Strand's body was very conveniently burned, so they can't see if it didn't decompose after death. But this umbilical cord, it means that somehow she was linked to the beaches. Hartman believes that these five beings were extinction entities, bringers of the death strandings, whether they were willing or not, which means Bridget may have been an EE. Higgs had called Amelie an EE. But they're still looking at this situation as though Amelie is the daughter of Bridget, and that Higgs is trying to cause a mass extinction event all on his own. Hartman needs to die for a few minutes, so his final order to Sam is to go west, and to be discreet when speaking with Die Hard Man. On the surface, business as usual. You know the drill, Sam Porter Bridges. Get to making them deliveries. The end is near. Get ready. Getting across that massive tar belt takes some creativity. You remember that fight that Sam had with Higgs a long while ago where he conjured up that godforsaken beached whale octopus predator squid thing? Well, a bunch of building structures came up with it, so what if Sam intentionally caused that again? Get caught by some BTs, really ruffle up some feathers in the dead world, and bring some beached bastards into the world of the living. And it actually works, at least enough to make a path of sorts across the belt. It's absolutely insane probably one of the most dangerous things that Sam has done thus far, intentionally get caught by beach things, but I mean, if it works, then it works. Don't worry, it's fine. But while things were kind of going well, at the heart of the tar belt is someone who just should not be there, Amelie. So of course, Sam abandons course and he runs to his sister. 
except once he gets close, he starts choking, drowning, reaching for her, and that bitch just turns and walks away. Sam is pulled under, into the tar. When he awakens, he's on that familiar beach. Amelie is walking by, singing a child's song. And this is reminiscent of the last time that he had died, during that void out at Central Knot City so long ago. She walks into the waters, and he follows. This is his repatriation cycle. He's pulled into the depths of the unknown and follows his strand back to the world of the living. And when he wakes up again, he's on the other side of the tar belt, exactly where he wanted to be. And don't worry, BB is fine, and so is Higgs. He's been waiting, being his same old... You know, can we just say it? He's a big old dick. He's a super giant asshole. Taunting with half-truths, concealing his intentions with word games, he says that Amelie is close, and he only really knows that because of Sam's rebuilding the chiral network. God, what an absolute C-word. Bless your heart, dick. At least now he'll openly show his face and lick everything in the setting, because apparently that's how Higgs communicates. He licks things. He has Amelie's necklace, and he knows how to really upset Sam, completely throw him off kilter. He immobilizes him, causes him physical pain, and taunts him about his sister, claiming that she is being held at a nearby beach. Killing Sam here won't accomplish anything. In fact, it would send him to the beach. It might actually help him. And then he can just return to life. Higgs can jump to the beach at will. Sam can't. He'll have to find his own way there. After the fact, Die Hard Man calls to act as a voice of calm and reason. They don't think that Higgs can just go to Amelie's beach. She should be safe and the chiral network still needs to be linked to Edge Knot City. He can't get riled up or lazy. Sam needs to connect the nearby distribution center and then Edge Knot City itself. Then they can handle Higgs. That night, Amelie once again appears to talk to, or rather, at Sam. She tells him her real name is Amerigo. So, Amerigo, Samantha, America, Amelie, Bridget Strand. According to her, she's safe from Higgs. He'll never reach her, but Sam must complete the chiral network to save her. He must connect Edge Knot City. But then a brief moment of perhaps honesty. She admits that what Higgs said is true. She is an extinction entity. She can absolutely wipe humanity out, but she doesn't want to do that. She wants to unite mankind, make them whole again. And then she asks Sam to stop her, to not end it all. Well, maybe I've been a little bit harsh on Amelie. The duality of her existence compels her to destroy, but maybe there is truth in Bridget's worldly desire to heal the world, or she's trying to alleviate her own guilt over what's bound to happen. This was her life work after all, and she's still not telling anyone the whole truth about what the network really is for. And then she's gone. Today is the day. Today, Sam reaches Edge Knot City. There are strange BTs about, floating around the ruins of this desolate place. If intel is to be trusted, the demons did this. They bombed the hell out of the city, they killed everyone within, and turned it into a BT hive. It's slow going, making it through Edge Knot. Every road is a hazard, but there is still an intact Bridges building with a chiral terminal at the heart of it. It's almost strange to see its lights. Bridges facilities have always just been destinations, sometimes irritants, but now it's like a beacon. Nothing and no one stops him from entering the building. Nothing and no one stops him from bringing Edge Knot onto the Chiral Network. With this final knot, the Chiral Network is fully complete. Everything is now tied to the beach. It can self-sustain. If ever one of the knots in it is destroyed or taken offline, the rest of the network will adapt and find ways to transmit information without going through that particular beach. Amelie had said that she would meet him here. Now, Sam just needs to wait. He rests and he dreams of the beach, a nightmare. Amelie's voice is warped and evil. She's dressed as Higgs. She then appears in the ocean, colossal in size. And then Amelie, dressed as Higgs, reveals her face and tells him that she is the extinction entity. When he awakens, the facility is on alert. Something is outside. Chiral density is extremely high. An unknown entity is approaching and combat is imminent. Sam readies himself and BB. They connect and share another memory of Clifford Unger singing sweetly to his BB, and then reality returns. Outside the facility, walking down the broken roads of Edge Knot City, is that great beach thing, which consumed Igor and caused the void out at Central Knot City so long ago. And adorned on its chest is Amelie. It's finally his time to shine. Higgs pops in and wastes no time thanking Sam for completing the chiral network. It's just what they needed. Higgs very patiently reminds Sam of everything he should have pieced together by now. There have been five mass extinction events, and the sixth is already underway. 
and at the heart of it, an extinction entity that controls the entire chiral network attached to her own beach. Amelie is here now, or as much as she can be as a soul in the world of the living. And yes, she is happy to see Sam. But Higgs rather seems to bring out the other side of her, the EE side. And she finally speaks of what is really happening here. She's merging all of mankind's beaches into a single shore, then pure extinction of all life on Earth. Everything before was just a prelude. And in case Sam hasn't put things together, Higgs steps in to clear things up. Amelie is the source of their curse, the dooms. The nightmares they'd suffered from all their lives, they were visions of her future, of her purpose. Amelie hugs him, asks him if he gets it, which turns into Higgs hugging him, telling him that he cannot stop what has already started. Even if he kills Higgs, it doesn't matter. Our fate is written. The Colossal BT is a blood sponge like no other. Sam has a literal rocket launcher in his arsenal to fight it and some heavy artillery at his disposal, but even with all that blood power, it takes constant, repeated hits to even dent it. It brings out BTs to get in his way, throws pure Chirelium into the field, and blindly swings down into the arena. When it's finally done and defeated, it breaks into an ungodly amount of pure Chirelium that is pulled back up into the beach. But no harm, no foul. Higgs and Amelie are just fine. She seems to be a bit subdued. There's no balance right now in the duality of her true self. The extinction is on hold. Her energy is depleted, but that's not the end of this. Maybe he wants to get Sam to the beach right now. Maybe he's just being snide about things. Maybe he wants to be a vindictive shit heel. Higgs shoots at Sam. It won't really kill him, of course, but it will still inflict pain. Bibi intercepts the shots with the sensor, though. This is a level of douchebaggery that she won't tolerate, and her very angry face very clearly conveys that she is done with Higgs and his bad attitude. So he shoots at her in her pod. Thank goodness it's bulletproof, but it still inflicts harm and stress on the infant, and it scares the hell out of Sam. Higgs tops off the encounter by shooting Sam several times in the back. What a dick. Sam comes back, returns to life. His best chance at reaching Amelie's beach now is fragile. It takes some effort, but she can come and go from the beach as she pleases. When he's had a rest and time to calm down, she, of course, appears to help in any way she can. She wants to have a few words with Higgs herself, so they're truly in this together. Sam has been to Amelie's beach a number of times, and while fragile herself doesn't know how to get there, Sam does. She'll help him make that jump, but he'll have to take the first steps alone. Once Sam is there, then she will be able to find him and she'll be able to follow. The two of them have a bond and that's all that she'll need to find him on the beach. Lou is going to stay behind on this one. She's already been through hellfire to get here and the beach is no place for a bridge baby. Fragile promises that if something should happen to him on the beach, she'll take care of Lou. Fragile is a powerful dooms user. It takes her barely 30 seconds to guide Sam through his jump. She is such a focused, calming being that when he's able to visualize his sister, when he's able to see her beach, Fragile sends him on his way. And when she's ready, she'll follow him there. When Sam wakes up, he's on Amelie's beach. It worked. And not far away, Amelie and Higgs are speaking. She seems surprised to see him and asks what he's doing here. Lest her sisterly side come out and she get distracted, Higgs intervenes and keeps the extinction entity focused. They weren't expecting Sam to arrive, but Higgs is completely ready to get this show on the road. It's his job to make sure that Amelie is able to follow through on this whole extinction affair, and it's one he'll gladly do. His only motivation is seeing this through. Why delay the inevitable? There's no coming back from death on the beach. While Amelie is readied for the final stranding, Higgs and Sam have themselves a fight. But for being the particle of God, Higgs is strangely weak to cargo to the face, and a terrible aim with a gun. Repeatedly, he fails to make lethal contact with Sam, despite having superior firepower here. And after getting the ship beaten out of him, he changes tactics, drops the gun, grabs a knife, stalks the field after him rather than being stationary. And if Sam tries to vanish, he'll start throwing grenades. Higgs is still highly vulnerable to the power of cargo, though. A good box to the face throws him off balance so that Sam can run in and repeatedly beat the shit out of him. And when Higgs can't win again, he confronts Sam in the waters of the ocean before the web that Amelie lays upon for a good old fist fight. The two of them punch, cuss, and grapple as the last of their strength starts to fade. For such a boisterous personality, Higgs has done very little to prove his mettle as the harbinger of the extinction entity. He took out entire cities, killed thousands in the name of vile mayhem, 
yet he can't beat a single man in a fist fight. Hmm, for shame. Sam beats the piss out of Higgs, but he promised Fragile that he wouldn't kill him, and he is a man of his word. So he drags the particle of God or whatever out of the blackened waters back to the beach. And yeah, Sam won the game, but he didn't stop anything. Fragile steps in and takes over this whole Higgs business, and Sam moves on to see his sister. Higgs tries to call upon Amelie for more power, to regain strength, to get an escape from what Fragile may do to him, but she doesn't respond to him. Higgs is on his own now. He has ugly words to say to Fragile, and she meets it with a firm cold clock. He's the damaged goods here, and now she will get to decide what to do with him. Before they have that heart-to-heart, Fragile speaks with Sam. With Higgs taken out, she can speak the truth of his deeds to the wilds of America. She can start to clean up her name, and his mask itself will be the proof of it. Bibi managed to make it all the way here to the beach. Sounds like when she went to make her jump, Bibi stowed away in her bag as equipment. Bibi is a special little thing to be able to do that. Bibi wanted to be here with Sam, and so he takes the pod pack. Stubborn little shit. Fragile offers to send him back east, but Amelie says that he doesn't need Fragile. He has the chiral network and her. Kinda rude. Kinda. Sam is more polite about thinking Fragile, but she's gotten the hint. The rest is between them, so she returns to Higgs, to her own affairs. Sam kind of hesitates in following Amelie the opposite direction, and she notices it immediately. Doesn't he believe in her? Yeah, she's an extinction entity, but all she wants is for everyone to be one. But God, at this point, even Sam is starting to question her. So she admits that the reason for all of this was to get it to come out west, to complete the chiral network, to finish what she had started. She was the only bait that would work to get him out here, and he was the only one that could do the work. And yeah, Die Hard Man was in on the whole thing. He knows that she's right. Sam wouldn't have done any of this otherwise. She was the only person that he had any ties to. And that justification of, it's okay that I betrayed your trust and put you through hell because in the end it did something good, especially for myself, is such a bullshit coward's way out. And then to do it with a smile. God, I want to dropkick this woman into her own stupid strand. But Sam puts it aside. Doesn't matter. He saved his sister. He saved America. And now they can just go home. For a while, they run up the beach. It's how they'll get back to the East Coast. The beach, it goes all the way down. The whole way, she says. And we know that Amelie is an extinction entity simply because she's running in high heels on a beach through sand and water and neither of her ankles are broken and with no chest support. At a hill, she asks Sam to stop, to wait, and for a while, he does. She disappears over some rocks, but he doesn't wait for too long. On the other side, he sees Amelie clad in white, speaking with Die Hard Man, but Die Hard Man doesn't have dooms. How is he on the beach? Seems that she finally invited him here, brought him here, and he's here to make things right. John Blake McLean knows that Amelie, Bridget, has done something. She's not making the world whole. She's ruining it. And he's going to stop her. He does try to follow through, to put a bullet in her, but she rightfully says that there is no atonement for them. And then she points to the waters, and from it emerges the combat veteran, Clifford Unger, Die Hard Man's former captain, a man that Bridges betrayed and killed. He didn't make it through the beach before the Death Stranding began. Even with the mask, Clifford recognizes this man. It takes a few tries to get his name, but he remembers. He remembers what these people did to him, what they took from him. But he doesn't turn his anger upon John. He stands before Bridget, but he doesn't even turn it upon her. He just wants his BB back. That's all that matters to him. And she points towards Sam. Goddamn backstabbing bitch. Clifford and his soldiers begin to walk down the shore towards him. And Sam doesn't have any weaponry with him, not this time. No way to fight back and very few places to hide. Amelie appears behind him, vanishing from the shoreline, again clad in red. And as though to save Sam from the wrath of Cliff Unger, she pushes him into the waves. It's time for him to return to the world of the living. She expels him from her beach. Dead Man is waiting for him when he wakes up. He's back across the tar belt in the middle of the country. They don't know where Amelie is. The last they'd heard from her, she said she was going to finish what Bridget started. They don't understand why Sam is saying that he saw Bridget on the beach, the woman that was clad in white. 
because they burned her body and everything. Her soul shouldn't be on the beach, not even on her daughter's beach. That doesn't make any sense to them. And Die Hard Man, he's been missing. He never came back. Dead Man is working on a theory that Cliff is holding Amelie and Die Hard Man captive on the beach, that he has somehow been the mastermind behind all the things happening right now. So if Sam can get back and stop Clifford Unger, then maybe problem solved? Sam can't get back to the beach without Fragile, and she is back east. Everyone actually is back east now, gathering to swear in a new president and form a functioning government for the United Cities of America big problem now is Fragile can't make any more jumps. The beaches aren't safe. They're so unstable that she could jump to the beach, get stuck, and never find her way off. So she just can't jump to him. They're all stranded precisely where they are unless they check out on foot. So Sam needs to run all the way across the country again, back to the East Coast to reach Fragile for her to send him back to the beach. Did you, did you think this was done? No, it's not done, because I don't think this game has editors. Sam's journey will be solo and a one-way trip. Hartman can still come and go from the beaches without getting trapped. Mama, Malingan, and her soul form can go to the beaches and take a look around. They'll keep an eye out for Amelie and Die Hardman. But for Sam, now comes that long trip back across America. Chiral density is far higher now that the chiral network is complete more BTs, more time fall, the trek back is logistically more simple, but it's still really dangerous. When he connects with BB, he gets more memories. He can blatantly see his mother Bridget in them, and another man who seems like he might be Die Hard Man. They did something to this BB, to Clifford. Dead Man continues to look into the matter, and he slowly pieces together that Cliff was somehow part of the early BB experiments, right before the Death Stranding kicked off. He thinks that his anger and resentment are so powerful that it's created the battlefields that Sam has been pulled into. But they need to know the full story behind his involvement before figuring out how to handle Unger. The more Dead Man looks into it, the darker the story becomes. Bridge babies were being used as foundations for the network, innocent human sacrifices. And if Clifford's child was a part of that, it's no wonder he was so full of rage. In fact, Dead Man thinks that Amelie literally used BBs in the infrastructure of the Knot Cities as she went west. So she was doing this shit up until the very end, even with Lochna and Malingan's work. Even Deadman, who not so long ago was calling BB a piece of equipment, says that the Chiral Network might be their proudest achievement, but it's also their guiltiest sin. But what Deadman can't figure out is, how did Cliff Unger get to Amelie's beach? How is it possible that he just invaded it like that? Deadman couldn't find any connections between Amelie and Unger, so it doesn't make any sense. Die Hard Man was on the beach, so maybe Clifford followed Die Hard Man there? But then how the hell was Die Hard Man there? See, you, none of it actually fits together. The pieces are all broken and misshaped. They're still operating under the assumption that Cliff is the big bad in all this, that Amelie is a good-hearted victim who needs to be saved. But Hartman, oh that wily one, he is starting to realize something. The network has connected everyone's beaches, and it's also creating a massive seam, a, a transit unit that BTs could use to mass flood Earth. The information superhighway works two ways, it seems, and he thinks that maybe Amelie's beach is of a higher plane than anyone else's, and having control of her beach would give whoever has power over it direct control over all of mankind. And here is where we're going to stop taking phone calls because these are things that we know the truth of and they just go over the same thing over and over again, different theories and conspiracies. And you know, I'm tired of saying the word beach. Over Lake Knot City is another storm brewing, a supercell, another transport to Cliff Unger's beach and it's right over where Sam needs to be. He needs to catch a ride back to the East Coast at Lake Knot. So he has to go into that supercell to deal with a combat veteran. Besides, maybe he can get some answers there. This storm is the biggest one yet, but he knows what to expect. BB cries in fear, but Sam stays calm, and he waits to be carried away. When he's pulled through, he has another memory flash of Cliff. He's clearly injured, telling BB how frightened he was when he found out his partner was pregnant. It took him a long time to realize that being a father, it actually made him brave. And as the clearly injured man holds BB, the man called John is ordered by a woman to shoot him. It's akin to an execution. Now Sam and BB are in a jungle war zone. It is incredibly vivid, but Unker has not realized that Sam is here yet. He's not hunting them yet. They have some time to get their bearings, work through the jungle, 
but that relative safety is short-lived. When Sam is close, Unger catches his scent, so to speak. He gets up from the murky depths and he starts his pursuit. His thoughts echo around the battlefield as Sam sneaks through. Clifford knows who Die Hard Man is. He wants his child back. He's still confused, but he remembers who and what he was. It again takes several dangerous run-ins with Clifford before the man stops fighting, before he's subdued long enough for Sam to approach. He doesn't do it with hostility, though. He sits at Unger's side, carefully. He wants to speak with him. He lets Cliff talk to Bibi, but not hold the pod. When Sam asks if he's Clifford Unger, it confuses him. Clifford whistles a bit of that lullaby to Bibi, and Sam whistles the next line to the absolute joy of Bibi. The giggling brings a sort of calm between the two men, and so they speak. Someone had told Clifford Sam's name. He calls him the bridge to the future. And as Clifford senses and peace returns to him, the sun begins to rise. The jungles are quiet. Clifford gifts to this man who brings people together his dog tag, and Sam offers to let him hold Bibi. For a moment, Clifford seems to feel happiness, and Bibi looks serene. That this, this is okay. This is good, in fact. Clifford gently hugs Sam, and after the sound of a single gunshot rings out, Clifford Unger vanishes. The next memory that comes is of Clifford, talking to the man John, who's telling his old captain to get Bibi and flee this place. His wife can't be saved. But Unger saved this man's life over and over, so he owes him. He owes him a great debt, so he'll help him any way he can. But if he is ordered to do something, he has to comply. Sam wakes up in Port Knot City on the far side of the lake, exactly on track for where he needs to be. Igor's brother, Victor, found him on the docks and got him taken care of. Sam meets with Deadman and he tells him that he thinks Cliff is Bibi's father. But Cliff was born so long ago, that's impossible, right? The soldier had given Sam his dog tag for a reason. He was trying to tell him something. Deadman had found a pre-recorded video from Die Hard Man labeled, If I Don't Come Back. And in it, he discloses that Amelie contacted him, offered to take him to the beach, gave him a doll that would help him get there. And he knew it was a trap, but he was going to go through with it. For a moment, he removes his mask, shows his face and talks about Amelie. He is the director of Bridges. Nothing is above his privilege, yet, he has never met Amelie in person. It's like she's a ghost. He challenges the viewer to disclose a single time that they've ever seen her in person or touched her. Everyone who was supposedly with Amelie at Edge Knot City, the people in that caravan, they were killed as soon as they arrived. Sam insists that he's seen her, that he's touched her, that he's been in her presence, but that was only ever on the beach, not in the living world. Die Hard Man's video repeats the cover story for Amelie's life, her supposed locked-in syndrome, why she wasn't around when she was a child, how she had powerful dooms, she could come and go from the beach at will, and Die Hard Man always believed Bridget's word. But once the network started coming online and old archives were made available, he just couldn't resist digging a little deeper into the story of Bridget Strand. When she was a young woman, she had uterine cancer. She couldn't conceive children. So there's no way that Amelie was her biological daughter. So where did she come from? It raises questions about everything they thought they knew. So he knew that he had to go speak to Amelie. He took a gun with a bullet made of Sam's blood. He wanted to understand and stop the death stranding, stop whatever Amelie was. So if Die Hard Man was going to the beach to confront and stop Amelie, then Clifford Unger was never the target. And Unger was never the one really calling the shots. Deadman is on the brink of putting it all together, but Fragile comes in to clear up a few things. Seems that she had a bit of a talk with Higgs on the beach, and he told her everything. Amelie was the one behind it all. The terrorist void outs, the chaos, the deaths. Higgs wasn't a terrorist before Amelie came along. He wanted more territory, he wanted to reach more people, possibly to do good, but she gave him corruptive power and brought out the real side of him like a real douchebag. Fragile got into Higgs BB pod and discovered that they never really had BB tech. They had dolls, totems that linked them to Amelie and her beach, the same kind of doll that Die Hardman was given to help reach her. She was working with the demons all along, helping them. She's a monster. Deadman saw dolls like these in Clifford Unger's battlefield too, which means she was also empowering and summoning him. Their only hope in handling this is to just find her, find the extinction entity, 
find Amelie or Bridget or whatever the hell she is, speaking with her and understanding, trying to reason with her, whatever it takes. And the only one that can do that is Sam. And the only one that can get him there is Fragile. The final stretch, getting back east, is rough as hell. BTs are all over the place, stronger, more aggressive ones. Things are quickly escalating to accompany the last stranding that's certain to take place very soon. It's a fight, right up to Capital Knot City itself. By the time he's arrived, Fragile is in a rough state. She has a strong connection to the beach, and with everything happening with the Death Stranding and Amelie and the chiral network fluctuations, while making all those jumps to the beach, it made her one sick lady. Some of Sam's cargo is actually crypto biotes to help her out and get her moving again. Turns out, Die Hard Man turned up in the time that it took Sam to get here. He's surprisingly not dead. Fragile gets herself moving after a few bug snacks, barely, but there's work to be done. Hartman finally has pieced things together, how important Amelie's beach is in all this, and why no one could ever reach it without her permission. She does exist on a higher plane, one inaccessible to all others, even if they do know the way. And all beaches connect back to hers. It's like she's the heart of a circulatory system. Furthermore, she decides the flow of the circulatory system. She can stop or send BTs through the beach, through the strands. It's all up to her. She is literally the Death Stranding and she controls who is allowed into her beach. She can force and keep people there as well. No one can stop her from doing this, at least not currently. They can only reason with her. And if Sam is allowed to go there, it's because she wants him to. There's a real possibility that she might decide to just keep him there forever. If he can't reason with her, then he might actually need to kill her. I mean, if that's even possible. And if he does succeed, then it will certainly strand him on her dead beach forever. So outside of a miracle, chances are this is going to be a one-way trip. But Sam's game, because there's no other way. And hell, maybe they will make it work. Maybe they can buy time, delay the final extinction event, find a way out of the destruction. Maybe Amelie can be reasoned with and will have answers for him. Sam's grown a lot through all of this. He was a selfish bastard for a very long time, completely out for himself, just surviving to see the next day, ornery as hell and difficult to be around. But all the stories that he's heard and the people that he's met have changed him for the better. He needs to believe in tomorrow and for a better life for the sake of those other people, to do right by them and by himself. He leaves Lou in the care of dead man. The poor kid has been through enough and is in desperate need of some healing, if that's even possible. The small group gathers around to witness Sam's departure. Fragile takes his hand, draws in close, and guides him to finding Amelie. She knows just what to say to help him find that beach, and then sends him on his way. He's back on her beach because she wants him to be, that's all. The waters here are bloody red, and dead things litter the sands. He sits for a while, and he waits. Eventually, she does show up. He knew she would, singing that weird kid song, clad in black now. But when she speaks, it's with the voice of Bridget, far older, more tired. Behind him, not far away in a hospital bed, is his mother, speaking to him. She's trying to make him understand. The death of Bridget Strand plays out again. She lunges out of the bed towards him, crawls towards him, sends her love, and says she'll be waiting on the beach, and then she has the face of Amelie. Clad in black again, she approaches with the gun that Die Hardman had brought, the one with the blood bullet meant to kill her. And finally, she can say it. She's Bridget, and Amelie, they're the same. The body and soul split, yet both still the extinction entity. A duality of mother and doom. The horizon is getting darker, colors are beginning to change, there's not much time left, but she'll explain everything to Sam. For some unknown amount of time, she talks, tells him about her existence, who and what she is, what she is meant to do, the things that she's already done, and says that he has two choices. I mean, she says that and then she points the goddamn gun at him with her finger on the trigger. The last stranding is underway. The many beaches of mankind are all linked to hers, and soon antimatter will flood through the seam and destroy this world. Sam can choose to do nothing, stay with her on the beach, watch the end of everything, but live here. Or he can help her sever her connection to the other beaches. It won't stop the Death Stranding. It is an inevitability that cannot be denied, but she will delay it. Mankind can carry on, their chiral network keeping their beaches connected, but she will exist outside of it. 
and she'll keep it that way as long as possible. It means that she will be here, alone, for who knows how long. So, a quick clean death? Or more struggling for time? Sam did all the work to make all of this possible, so he gets to decide. But he only has until she reaches the water's edge to do so. And he hesitates briefly. But after all he's been through, he's not going to just watch it get snuffed out. No one gets to steal that much life. So he shoots. He unloads the gun at her, but none of the bullets make contact. They go right through her. So he runs out to the waters, and he physically grabs her, pulling his sister into a hug with a promise that he'll always be there for her, like she was for him. He remembers one more time when he was a kid, crying on the beach. He didn't want to go home, so she made him feel better. The dream catcher gift. All along, that was his tie to her beach. It was that treasure from his sister. He understands now that all these years, all this time, she was guiding him towards this. She didn't know what was going to happen, but she knew that Sam could make this choice when the time was right. She gave him time and perspective. She let him build his own life and be a part of hers. Let him love and struggle so that he could see this problem from every angle and decide. And if he wants for life to continue on, then she promises she will stay here on this beach for as long as she can, alone until she just can't anymore. But there's no compromising the finale. Even if it takes hundreds of thousands of years, the extinction will happen. They share final words, have their final embrace, and Amelie pushes Sam back into the waters. For now, humanity will survive. But this isn't the end of it. There are important personal affairs that Sam needs to see too. Amelie told him a bit about Clifford Unger, why she started using him and allowed them to be brought together. There was something about Clifford that she wanted him to know, but that was something that he needed to discover. Amelie sent him back to his own beach, but it's a strange spot that he's never been to before, where he just walks around reflects, thinks, like he's not sure how he's supposed to leave. Eventually, he seems angry and frustrated. In the sky, he looks up and he sees the five extinction entities from history. But the living world has been waiting long enough for him to get it together. Dead Man reaches through the waters and pulls his ass back down. There is a new president to be sworn in over the United Cities of America, after all. It is Die Hard Man who will run the country. And he really is best suited for the job anyways. He can finally take off the mask and start atoning for the sins of this government. The secrets of Bridget and Amelie will be kept safe. The new world will regard them as heroes of the time. Die Hard Man has a lot of politician-y, flowery, well-drafted words to say, but it feels like it's really never-ending babble. When he starts talking about unsung heroes of their triumphs, Sam decides it's time to head out. Dead Man catches him in the hallway and excitedly starts telling him about how they found the beach he was on. They'd racked their brains, thinking about where Amelie could have sent him to. Neither Mama nor Hartman could find him. He was missing for over a month. Die Hard Man's gun was what they used to find his location. Mama had found him at some crazy far corner of his own beach, and Dead Man and BB were able to jump in and grab him. The pins they all wear now are like a societal totem created from Bridget Strand's umbilical cord. It helps them all stay connected, helps them each find each other's beaches. And now it's time to start wrapping up those loose ends. Dead Man knows who Cliff's wife was, Bibi's mother, Lisa Bridges. And the man who killed Cliff was identified in records as John, Die Hard Man. Dead Man has got that bastard's number, and though he's not going to try to damage Die Hardman or spill his secrets, the higher-ups within Bridges have access to his and Bridget Strand's records now, as does Sam. So if he ever gets curious, he is welcome to review them. And speaking of John, he's waltzing down the hall at just this moment, and he would like to speak with Sam. Like, he kinda knows his jig is up. He confesses to killing Clifford Unger, out of love for the president. But he's called Die Hard Man because of his captain, whom he also dearly loved. Unger brought his ass back from war time and time again. He wouldn't let him die. On that beach, when he was confronted by a literal ghost of the past, when Clifford emerged from the waters of the ocean, he felt that he deserved to die. Die Hard Man deserved to die by the hands of Clifford Unger. Yet his captain still didn't raise a hand against him, despite his sins. He believes that it was love that brought back Clifford, love for his BB, not hatred against others. John Blake McLean will struggle to understand Cliff's mercy for all the rest of his life, trying to earn it and atone for his past. He 
He thinks this means that he must always be Die Hard Man, the unkillable, the immortal leader, but Sam protests that sentiment strongly. The world doesn't need more immortals who don't value life, who don't fear death. Life is hard enough without tyrants bulldozing through. This is the punishment that he truly deserves. He has to be a better man, a killable man, and he must create a better future, serve those that he decides for, the true and proper burden of a leader. Kill the old ways and let them die hard. And there's more pain for Sam to feel. It's little Lou. Dead Man wasn't able to heal her. She spent so long away from the rest of a still mother, and she was pushed to extreme stress. Her pod was damaged by Higgs, and she didn't rebound. The final decommission order came down from the president. It's time to let her go. Soon her body will die and necrosis will begin, so she needs to be taken to an incinerator. Dead Man does offer that... Sam could take her out of the pod, see what happens. It would be defying an executive order, so he would need to do it away from the city and surveillance. But the chances of a BB surviving outside of their pod, even in the best of circumstances, are low. Lou has been pushed far past her limits. Dead Man gives the BB a hug. He has grown quite fond of the little one. He sees BBs as more than equipment now, thanks to these two. And he hates to see her go. Sam agrees to take her to the incinerator, but before he leaves, Deadman takes his cufflink offline. If Sam wants, he can remove it. He'd be untrackable, invisible. The UCA wouldn't know where he was or what he was doing. If he wanted to do that, it's up to him. Sam gives Deadman a sturdy hug before he heads out, a true and genuine show of gratitude and friendship between them. And then he's off. Fragile is outside, hanging out to say see you later to Sam. The Fragile Express is now an official UCA contracted delivery company, so she'll be around, helping rebuild the country and all that. She discloses that uh, she didn't kill Higgs. She let him choose between final death on the beach or staying there stranded for hopefully eternity. And he chose to be stranded. That doesn't mean he'll actually stay there, though. Without Amelie to feel his insane powers, he might just be stuck for a while. Sam doesn't mind though, and he doesn't blame her. He's not worried about it. Being trapped there for eternity is a fitting punishment for Higgs, and tomorrow can keep its own problems. She offers him a job again before he leaves, but Sam has lost everything and now he's probably going to lose Lou too. He is not in a mindset to think for the future. He's stuck in his sadness again, feeling like a dead man walking, no better than when they had met so long ago in that cave. He feels like everything he touches, he loses. So it's easier to not even try, right? He and Lou have one last trip to make together, and there's no sense in waiting. He tries talking to her as they go, but Lou's unresponsive to everything, and he blames himself for that. This kid saved his ass time and time again, and this is the ending that she's going to get. He runs the same route that he took long ago when he was taking his mother's body up to the same incinerator. Feels like a lifetime ago at this point. Just him and his cargo. When he reaches the facility, he reconnects to the pod again just to see if Lou is still in there. And this time, he gets a cohesive narrative from those memories. It's what happened to Clifford Unger and his BB. Bridget's betrayal of Unger's trust, John trying to help him, the death of Lisa, Cliff trying to take his child and escape, and then it ends. Sam walks BB into the incineration room, remembers everything Dead Man told him, and he takes off his cufflink. He's done with bridges, done being a delivery boy, done doing other people's hard work for them. Being alone is just easier, so he won't be returning. He sets Lou on the slab as well, but that little question of what if just won't let him walk away. Broken hopes and hearts are a terrible thing, but what if? He reconnects one more time to the pond. There must be more of her story to be told, and he wants to know it all. Sam sees with almost surreal clarity every bit of the memories. Clifford was cornered, shot, forced to retreat with BB back into that medical room. And Sam actually sees himself within the memory, like this memory is so rich and connected with this world that he's physically there. Cliff was shot as soon as military forces were in the room, which Sam instinctively tried to stop, ignoring that it wasn't real, yet it felt so real. Clifford said his gut-wrenching goodbye to his child somehow got the baby out of the pod. And then, that truth that Amelie had spoken of on the beach. The one about Clifford Unger that Sam needed to discover. 
Clifford Unger addresses Sam directly, his bridge to the future. He lived a life dividing people. He was a dead end, a drop off, a cliff to be avoided. But Lisa changed that. Sam, his son, his BB changed that. He got to be the father of a man who brought people together, changed and built the world in ways that he never could. Sam realizes that he has been the BB in the pod this whole time, not Lou. Lou just helped him reach those memories. She was a blessed little conduit. Sam has to watch his father's death, shot in the back by Bridget and John. Then the dead child washed up on the beach and Amelie finding them. She heals its wound, the scar matching the same one on Sam's abdomen, the first repatriate. It breaks the balance between the world of the living and the dead. This is the source of the death stranding. Little Sam is sent back, his past washed away and adopted as Bridget Strand's son. Back in the waking living world, Sam has gotten Lou out of the pod and is doing whatever he can to get her breathing on her own. CPR on a baby is absolutely terrifying and it's a tough sequence to watch. As he works on her, her strand, her link to the beach, it becomes visible. She can't be in the middle of life and death. To exist in this world, she has to be living. And when it seems that Lou is lost and can't come back, he despairs for a moment, but just for a moment. And then Lou turns fussy. She's holding Amelie's goddamn necklace. That little shit apparently met with her new auntie, the extinction entity, and was promptly sent back to be part of the world of the living. The two of them go outside into the clean rains. No fear of timefall or BTs, not here. Little Lou just proved everything Sam had said to Fragile was wrong. He does have purpose, meaning a future. Not everything he touches goes away. Lou is proof of that. Louise. 